The world of competitive Super Smash Bros. has a long and storied history, dating all the way back to the dark ages of the early 2000s. You may have heard stories of Mewtwo King, Ken, PC Chris, and the other legends of the time. But there's a period of Smash history that is almost completely absent from the record books, that is still shrouded in darkness. Melee's early ages have been pretty well documented, but as the Brawl community transitioned to Smash 4 and then to Smash Ultimate, many hallowed tales from its ancient history have been seemingly lost to time, with nobody left to tell them. This is one such tale. Smash Bros may be considered legitimate now, but there were many growing pains that came with Smash's slow transformation from party favorite to international esport. This tale from Brawl's past is about a very unique set of circumstances that came together to create what I think is the most bizarre match in Smash history. But before we get into the match, let me set the scene. It's a balmy June morning in Columbus, Ohio. The Hyatt Regency is host to one of the biggest gaming events of the summer, one of the stops on the MLG Pro Circuit. The games featured include the hottest titles like Halo, World of Warcraft, Starcraft, and Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Because of a licensing issue with Nintendo, who were strangely against competitive play at this time, none of Brawl could be streamed. That doesn't mean there's no recorded footage, though. If you look through all the videos of the event, most of them recorded from the crowd, on early cell phones, you'll find a long list of Smash Legends, names both new and familiar. But one match in particular holds a very special place in the heart of many an old Brawl fan. This is Mike Hayes. Mike Hayes is a Marth player from Southern California. He's considered the best Marth in the United States and one of the best Marth players in the world alongside Mr. R and Leon in Europe and Mike Neko in Japan. While not one of the absolute top dogs of the tournament scene, Mike Hayes is certainly a bracket threat to any competitor. Funny enough, the same could be said for his character of choice, Marth. See, while Marth isn't really considered a top tier in Brawl in the traditional sense, Marth has an unusually good matchup spread against the whole cast. See, the Brawl metagame was kind of like a food chain. The Snake eats the Diddy Kong, the Olimar eats the Snake, the Falco eats the Olimar, the Ice Climbers eat the Falco, and Meta Knight eats everybody. The top characters generally stomp out anybody that's not in their cool clubhouse, but they all have their natural predators within. Marth, by comparison, is kind of an anomaly. Despite a losing matchup to Meta Knight, because everybody loses to Meta Knight, Marth enjoys an even to winning matchup spread against the entire cast. Even the DDD matchup, which looks unfavorable on paper, has been proven doable thanks to superior mobility and a very tight window for DDD's signature chain grab. It's hard, but Marth can do it. The reason this is important is because it puts Marth in a fantastic position to face the unpredictable tides of a tournament bracket, where you could face any character at any time. Unfortunately though, Luck is not on Mike Hayes' side today. He only gets to round three before running up against fellow SoCal native Rich Brown, probably the top Olimar player in the world at this time in 2010. Rich defeats Mike Hayes, sending him down into the loser's bracket pretty early. But things aren't all bad. Mike defeats Dark Energy, top Pikachu player Anther, and a top Meta Knight named Kel, to make it all the way to top 32. Mike is poised to take the loser's bracket by storm, ready to cut down anybody in his path. That is, until he meets a player by the name of Ook. Ook is an enigma, a shadow of the mysterious region known as the Midwest. See, tournament footage didn't really exist back then like it does now. If you were lucky enough to live in SoCal or Tri-State, you'd be featured in tons of gameplay documentation thanks to heroes like Truth's Reverie, Ninja Link, Video Game Boot Camp, or Clash Tournaments. But the Midwest is much less concentrated. It's, it's a lot more like a scattered fiefdom, with players often driving six plus hours to go to regionals of maybe 50 people. This meant the vibe was completely different. Midwest players were famously a lot more laid back and communal, less sweaty. Winning was nice, but spending time playing Smash with friends was nicer. Some of the Midwest states have more visibility than others. Michigan in particular holds some of the most well-known players in the country, like Lane, Anther, Judge, Shugo, and more. But many other states are populated by hidden bosses, elusive warriors whose names are spoken in whispers. There's Christides, the Wario from Indiana, a madman who uses Wario's bike tires like throwing knives. There's Judo, the Sheik from, uh, Kentucky, I think, who somehow discovered a way to make the character look functional. And then there was Ook, a large imposing figure, more hair than man. When Mike Hayes faced his next opponent, he hadn't simply encountered your run-of-the-mill Meta Knight or maybe a garden variety Falco. No, Ook played Donkey Kong, and he played it 
Well, as I said before, finding footage of Ook is kind of difficult. He's achieved something of a mythical status in the community nowadays. Few VODs of his play exist, and as far as I can tell, he doesn't play Smash anymore, so I solicited my Twitter audience to help find photo evidence of the guy. They sent over a couple videos where he appears, including this screw attack feature that's funnier than anything I've ever done. <gasps> In the end, he actually replied to my tweet with this pic, so it was all worth it. A uh, quick side note before we go any further. I was actually once in a car that dropped this guy off at his house, and I watched him walk barefoot in shorts through a foot of snow to get back to his apartment. So yeah, he's a peculiar guy. But perhaps the most peculiar thing about him is his character choice. See, Donkey Kong in Brawl is not a good character. Because of his big size, terrible disadvantage, and abysmal recovery, DK loses to nearly everyone in the top half of the cast, including a nearly unwinnable matchup against DDD, falling victim to an infinite chain grab that players could learn in mere minutes. The best DKs could still prevail against this strategy, but it was a monumental challenge. But despite all of his shortcomings, Donkey Kong had a uniquely favorable matchup up against one top tier, Marth. It sounds strange to say now, but what you need to understand is that Brawl Donkey Kong doesn't function like he does in any other game. Players familiar with Melee, Smash 4, Ultimate, or even Project M might know DK as a pseudo-grappler, a character who gets lots of damage and maybe even kills from his cargo throw setups. Brawl DK isn't really like that. In a game with few combos, DK is weirdly almost a sword character. He uses super long disjointed limbs to keep the opponent at bay through tilts and his best move by far, his back air. This thing is long. And in the minds of many a player, this alone is enough to push the Marth DK matchup to at least even. It might even be favorable for DK. And for Mike Hayes, the SoCal native, this is a disaster. SoCal is in contention with Tri-State as the best brawl region in the world, and you don't get that title with a gaggle of mid-tiers running around. Most players in the best regions opted for the best characters, which meant that Mike Hayes had tons of practice against Falcos, Meta Knights, Snakes, and other killers. So now, Mike Hayes is here, halfway across the country, staring at the character select screen, facing down an opponent he knows nothing about, wielding a tricky character that may very well well beat his own. And everyone is watching. Alright, so let's take a step back. In case you don't know, in Smash competition, tournament sets usually run a best of three format. You have to win two games to beat your opponent, and in between the games, the loser gets to pick the stage and their character. This is devised in such a way so that, theoretically, the best player wins more often than not. Unfortunately, there is no surviving footage of the first two matches here. Between Nintendo's bullheaded anti-streaming practices and our primitive technologies, these games are simply lost to time. But that doesn't matter, because beautifully, what we have here in this third game tells us the whole story. Using deductive reasoning, we can assume that Mike Hayes won game one, Ook won game two, and Mike Hayes was given the choice to counterpick both stage and character. And for their final encounter, he went here. And him. Now, if you go back and look at the history of Smash, you'll find some games on some pretty weird stages. Whether it's Corneria or Pokey Floats in Melee or Rainbow Cruise and Pirate Ship in Brawl, the rules for what could or could not be considered competitive were way looser in the past. You would see all kinds of stuff. But I just want to stress this, this stage was never allowed. Green Greens has, to my knowledge, only been legal at the MLG Pro Circuit events and nowhere else. Between the walls, the bomb blocks, the close blast zones, and the apples that can somehow RNG between being free health or throwable items, this stage was never considered a valid stage for competition. But Mike Hayes had picked it, and he also picked King DDD. Do you remember before how I mentioned that DDD had an infinite chain grab against DK that players could learn very quickly? Well, that wasn't everything. He could also chain grab opponents against walls infinitely, with zero concerns for actually timing his grabs, thus removing the whole learning part from the equation entirely. We can assume that after losing game two, Mike Hayes was so intent on winning this set that he threw his conventional main to the wind and chose the absolute optimal stage and character choice for the situation. He would be able to chain grab DK 
against any of these walls, meaning nearly any grab on DK would mean certain death for that stock. Not only that, he could also use DDD's Waddle Deep projectiles to force Ook to approach, since DK didn't have a projectile of his own. As the game loads in, things seem dire for Ook. Little did he know that what would happen next would be pure magic. The match starts off with Mike Hayes immediately littering the field with his projectiles. After a couple of throws, he attempts to hit a jumping forward aerial on Ook, but because he doesn't actually play DDD, he doesn't know that inputting aerials near Waddles actually prioritizes throwing the Waddle instead. He takes a back air from Ook, and Ook quickly resets by retreating to the left platform, showing off some new tech in the process. What? He takes 20% for his efforts. He taunts. Mike Hayes rebukes him. Ook makes the incredibly risky decision to jump into the wall, but Mike Hayes' unfamiliarity with DDD allows him to safely retreat. A bomb falls on his head. He has now taken 4% from Mike Hayes and 40% from Green Greens. Ook tries for a risky headbutt play to break Mike Hayes' shield, but it doesn't pan out. Mike Hayes finally lands a grab here, and the horror commences. Even Wispy himself seems to conspire against him, as he blows in the opposite direction instead of disrupting the infinite. Eventually, Wispy relents, and Ook escapes. But Mike Hayes secures the first kill. Ook comes back with some offense, but Mike immediately uses DDD's massive recovery to get back to center stage. This is costly because it's slow to start up and lengthy in its recovery, guaranteeing he'll be punished somewhere along the way. But for Mike Hayes, that's a trade he'll happily take. Mike's lack of familiarity with the character is requiring him to lean on the safe and simple strategies that the walls allow for. These blocks in this center stage is his lifeline, and if the cost for being there is some 40-something percent, he'll happily pay that toll. Ook retreats to the left platform. Apples come down from the tree. And when Ook goes to pick one up, he eats it. Mike Hayes' apple, however, is an item for some reason, and he uses it to get a bit more damage. Ook secures an early kill by hitting a huge punch. The crowd erupts. Ook retreats to the left platform again. He's made a big play, but he still needs to approach. See, in competitive Smash, if the timer runs down to zero, the player with the higher percentage automatically loses. And without a projectile to speak of, Ook is forced to take back to the sky. Ook misses a hit, but finds something even better. For a moment, anyway. The king escapes. After a bit of a drought, Mike Hayes secures another grab. But with no wall in sight and no practice on the infinite, DK quickly escapes. Suddenly, for seemingly no reason, Mike Hayes charges a forward smash attack near a wall of four bombs. If he gets hit by this, he's probably dead. But miraculously, this happens. Ook lands another giant hit out of nowhere at just 80%. Mike Hayes survives. Mike Hayes jumps off the top of the map and dies. Ook begins to play to the crowd, but he takes so long to do so, he gets grabbed again. The crowd asks him. He lives. The dynamic has now changed. Mike Hayes must now be the one to approach since Ook has a stock lead. Wispy once again betrays Ook and rains a blessing of apples down upon Mike Hayes. Or so we thought. Look, guys, I have absolutely no idea what happened here, and neither does the crowd, clearly. Some apples are items, some apples are food. Do some apples explode? I, I don't know. Brawl is a game of endless mystery. Ook lands some offense, but bets everything on a risky up smash. He tries to end the game with one last big punch. Mike Hayes deftly dodges. It's grab time. He goes to the wall. His pummel causes an explosion, and somehow, Ook survives at 192%, and then dies. The atmosphere is tense as the game reaches its final stock. The win condition is clear for both players. For DK, punch. For DDD, grab. One of either will kill. A chant begins to erupt from the crowd. Ook 
Uke holds his position. Remember, Mike Hayes has to come to him. If the time runs out, then Mike Hayes loses. And because of Uke's positioning, getting a grab against the wall will be extremely difficult. Mike Hayes approaches. A scramble breaks out, and then, disaster! They both survive. Seemingly out of nowhere, Mike Hayes lands a Waddle D on Ook. The knockback knocks Ook into the air and into a terrible position. Mike Hayes capitalizes by approaching. Ook dodges, expecting an aerial, but there is only one thing on Mike Hayes' mind. There's another scramble. And then, a miracle. And just like that, Ook won. The bomb block was so close that DDD's body actually sat on it killing Mike Hayes instantly. Because he was still holding down after the throw, DDD got launched at a terrible angle. Ook, by contrast, was actually holding up to survive the guaranteed follow-up. I was there that day. Somewhere in this swirling mass of humanity, you may even see my face. Maybe here? Or maybe there? Maybe that guy? I, I don't know. It doesn't matter, really. We were all one. Ook had won the day. The champion had overcome. It's now been over 12 years since MLG Columbus 2010, and I still think about this match a lot. This video, which currently has just 16,000 views, is still fondly remembered by an increasingly small subset of the current community. It's a perfect remnant of a bygone age, a snapshot before the specter of esports had come to take its toll, when the very idea of competitive Smash Bros was at its most nascent. In a time before career prospects, lucrative sponsor deals, or the hyper-competitive landscape we see today, this match lives on forever. Just two nervous dudes from two very different places in America, and Donkey Kong and King DDD on Green Greens. Thank you for watching.